Chapter 3 The Rise of Fascism Mussolini's Movement A leading figure in the Italian socialist movement and editor of the party paper, Benito Mussolini had left the party in 1915 to advocate his country's entry into the war on the Allied side. Discharged from the army, he had supported the party of those who felt that Italy had been meanly treated in the peace settlement and lent his pen to the advocates of a tough, expansionist policy. In brackets, see chapter 6, and brackets. But a secondary role in nationalist politics did not appeal to Mussolini, and while D'Annunzio strutted in Fiume, holding Italy's allies at bay, Mussolini found more promising situations to exploit in Italy itself. Inspired by the Russian Revolution, and by an economy bankrupted by war, mismanagement, and the end of Allied aid, a series of strikes were putting the fear of revolution into the Italian propertied classes. The workers were dissatisfied, and they distrusted Mussolini as a renegade. But there were other dissatisfied elements in Italy besides the syndicated workers. Students, soldiers, discharged veterans, unable to readjust to civilian life, disliked the existing order too, although they did not want to replace it with a class dictatorship. It was to these people that Mussolini turned, not to preserve the existing order, but to revolutionize it and, thus, remove those conditions which both justified and favored the revolutionary activities of his, quote, red, end quote, rivals. The first Fascio di Combattimento was set up in Milan on March 23rd, 1919. The ideas for which it claimed to stand were far from reactionary. In brackets, see reading number 1A, end bracket. The Fascios wanted to disassociate themselves from classical, in quotations read, end quotations, revolution. But their own program was almost as radical. They would put an end to the monarchy, abolished the Senate, the aristocracy, compulsory military service, banks and stock exchanges, confiscate unproductive revenues, attack the money power, decentralize government, protect and educate the poor. Although Mussolini's Popolo d'Italia changed its subtitle from Socialist Daily to Producers Daily, it continued to support the workers' revolutionary agitation, and Mussolini himself claimed he had remained a socialist. In effect, to begin with, the Fascios supported the strikes that raged throughout North Italy, even the first sit-in strikes of 1919, when the workers took over the factories and challenged army and police to dislodge them. A fascist resolution of July 1919 affirmed, in quotations, a boundless solidarity with the insurgent people against those who starve it, end quotation. In the spring of 1920, the Popolo d'Italia criticized the all-engrossing state for its intervention in industrial conflicts on the side of capital against the workers. And when, by August 1920, Mussolini began to look upon sit-in strikes with a critical eye, it was less, he said, because of their threat to the property principle than because of their inefficiency and their lack of perspective. In quotations, Had their organizers meant to use them as a jumping board for much vaster ends, end quotation, he, for his part, would have been ready to accept them. But belly socialism, he said, was not for him nor the limited material ends which alone the unions envisaged. Strikes, used for such petty purposes, lost sight of the greater aim of a final revolution and could but fritter away the energies and power of the workers. For his part, the fascist leader envisaged not piecemeal reform, but radical changes. These Mussolini could approve, as he did in a speech delivered at Trieste on September 20, 1920, while a general strike immobilized Piedmont and Lombardy. I accept not only, in brackets, the idea of, in brackets, workers' control of factories, but also the social, cooperative, management, in brackets, of industry, end brackets. I want industrial production to rise. If the workers could guarantee this rather than the owners, I should be ready to declare that the former have the right to take the latter's place. End quotation. In these words, we recognize the tone of pragmatic competition which would permit the fascists to turn from revolution to counter-revolution, from being the rivals of the communists to being their opponents. One of Mussolini's admirers has called him a condottiera, a soldier of fortune, 
and this provides a clue to the fact that within two years of the radical verbiage of 1919, we find the Fascios acting as strike breakers, and within three years, the professed socialist Republican being called to power by his king. It is more than likely that part of the reason for such a switch lies in the fascists' need for money. But soldiers of fortune seek power even more than money, and Mussolini had realized that in his race for power against the communists and the socialists, who were firmly entrenched in labor unions and city councils, he could only be successful with the support of the conservative representatives of established order. With the communists, he shared a revolutionary radicalism in which he could never convincingly overbid them. With the conservatives, he shared a common nationalism and a common regard for authority and order, in which the conservatives' inefficiency and their moderation left them at a disadvantage. It was immaterial that for Mussolini the authority and order in question were to be his own. This was a matter to be clarified later. The conservatives could help him attain power. This secured, there was time enough to install an order broadly similar to that which he had advocated in 1919, but adapted rather to the needs of an ever-changing situation than to the points of a particular doctrine. Mussolini's movement and Mussolini's order, then, appear as the prototype of modern fascism, which is in effect an opportunistic activism inspired by dissatisfaction with the existing order, but unwilling or unable to proclaim a precise doctrine of its own and emphasizing, rather, the idea of change, as such, and the seizure of power. Difficult, though it may be to conceive, such inspiration can provide a very powerful impetus for a revolutionary movement, the effect of positive statements in politics being generally divisive and that of negative ones unifying. Many a revolution has been carried out by people who did not know what they wanted, but knew very well what they opposed. Dynamics of Fascism This was a lesson fascist leaders never failed to apply. In quotations... It would be folly to describe precisely in advance the road by which we shall attain, in brackets, our principles, and brackets, end quotation. Writes Oswald Mosley, The Greater Britain, in brackets, 1932, end brackets. In quotations, a great man of action once observed, no man goes very far who knows exactly where he is going, end quotations. And the Belgian, Leon de Grel, in quotations, you must get going, you must let yourself be swept away by the torrent. You must act. The rest comes by itself. End quotations. Across the border, in France, one of Jacques Doriot's most brilliant followers in the PPF, in brackets, French Popular Party, end brackets, sings the same song, in quotations. It is not the program that counts. What counts is the mentality of the party that proposes the program. End quotation. Trio La Rochelle would write in 1936, in quotations, Do not ask us first what is our program, but what is our mentality. The PPF spirit is a spirit of life, of action, of speed, end quotations. Dorio was a renegade communist. His chief competitor, renegade socialist Marcel Diat, thought the same, in quotations, fervor, end quotation. He told his followers of the Rassemblement National Populaire, in quotations, is sometimes better than enlightenment and clarity, end quotations. In brackets, see readings number 1c, end bracket. What a movement needed to succeed, and it is important to remember that the sense of movement was essential in fact as well as name, was a mystique, a principle, or an idea to which it could appeal, which could sweep its followers off their feet and off their minds, toward a goal left imprecise except in terms of power. In quotations, it is not a question of working out a program, end quotation, a French right-wing terrorist declared, in quotations. The question we seek to solve is of a higher order. We have to find the idea, the dynamic of salvation, the dynamic of action. Only an ideal, only a mystique are likely to redeem us, to raise us, to make possible the redeeming ascent towards the bright pinnacles of the future, end quotation. The curtain of lyricism discarded, questions do arise nevertheless, in quotation, ascension towards what, end quotation, in quotation, change in what direction, end quotation, quotation, power for what purpose, end quotation. 
and the answers to such questions provide an indication, if not of these movements' doctrines, at least of their tenor. In this connection, we should do well to remember that fascism never denied its early social radicalism. On the contrary, it considered itself a form of socialism, freed of humanitarian sentimentalism and Marxist dialectic, truer to fundamental socialist aims in that it tried to adapt itself to a changing historical reality which the old Marxist interpretation no longer suited. Socialism, by this time, had become a practically meaningless term. In certain cases, it served as a pejorative label to stick on objectionable men or measures. In others, it provided a popular description of desired but undefined reforms. Definitions like, in quotations, socialism is equality, end quotation, or, in quotations, socialism is justice, end quotation, do not go far before they beg the question how this equality or this justice are themselves envisaged. Socialist reform has generally been connected with measures carried out following a general plan and involving a redistribution of national income and social influence according to decisions made by specialists in the service of a central power. In other words, as it became effective, socialism became increasingly technocratic and moved further away from its original moral and humanitarian inspiration. Considerations of humanity and social justice play a smaller part in modern technocratic planning, in brackets, be it under the impulse of socialist ideas, end brackets, than they did in the original socialism of the 19th century. Material comfort and social and economic opportunity are desired for all, but they are wanted for utilitarian reasons and within the limits of more general interests. The good of the community may not and often does not coincide with the immediate good of single individuals. Much of the original inspiration of European socialism, on the other hand, had come from humanitarian rather than utilitarian concerns. The social romantics of the early 19th century had been moved by charity, not calculation, and it is useful to distinguish between humanitarian socialists and utilitarian ones. There is little to prevent the latter from operating on the national, or indeed, if convenient, the nationalist plane. Humanitarian socialism is almost necessarily pacifist and internationalistic, because the same concerns that make men care for their fellows at home apply to human beings everywhere. It is idealistic because it is founded on sentiment and on ideals. Being so, it will do best in fairly prosperous societies where a margin for luxury exists. This kind of socialism is useful as a palliative for the more obvious forms of economic distress and as an educative force, but it tends to collapse before the self-interest of individuals or of the group. Its adherents, then, have the choice between small-scale martyrdom, in brackets, as in the case of conscientious objectors, end brackets, and conformity, in brackets, as in the case of those who suspend their pacifism in wartime, end brackets. Utilitarian socialism, on the other hand, is opportunistic and empirical. It is doctrinaire, but ready to use doctrine in its maneuvers and to adjust its theory to the moment's needs. Its tendency is to consider human beings only as part of groups, in which it sees a significant unit of political calculation. Where humanitarian socialism is sentimental, utilitarian socialism tries to be mathematical. And, given this approach, there is no reason to wonder at apparent changes in orientation, such as can be found, for instance, so frequent in Soviet history. When the socialism in question is of the utilitarian kind, its combination with nationalism is possible. Mussolini in Italy, Hitler in Germany, and Perón in Argentina all claim that they had revivified socialism and given it a new efficacy and a fresh connection with historical evolution. Their claims were confirmed by many opponents who, outside of communist ranks, recognized a characteristic of the fascist or national socialist appeal that later observers would ignore. In quotations, the National Socialists, it is essential to remember, call themselves socialist, as well as nationalist, end quotations, wrote the Daily Herald, organ of the British Labour Party, on May the 2nd, 1933. In quotations, their socialism is not the socialism of the Labour Party, or that of any recognized socialist party in other countries, but in many ways it is a creed that is anathema to the big landowners, the big industrialists, and the big financiers, and the Nazi leaders are bound to go forward with the socialist side of their program, end quotation. 
from the opposite pole, a sometime collaborator of Hitler, suggests that the speculations of national communism had not been completely devoid of substance. In quotations, the Third Reich, end quotation, warned Hermann Rauschning, in quotations, is actually bringing into operation a sort of socialism. We may call it Prussian socialism, or state socialism, or the total mobilization of the nation, or the beginning of the grandiose democracy of work. The revolution will proceed on its course, and it will do so through the initiative of a revolutionary elite in cooperation with masses excited into revolutionism. End quotation. While the old order, political and economic, creaked and strained, parliamentary socialist parties had become part of the establishment, adopting its methods and its ideas of gradual reform which, it was hoped, would reconcile the workers to the common prosperity of the capitalist system. To the left of this conservative socialism stood the Communist Party, with its slogans of class warfare and its foreign connections. Fascism appeared as an alternative to both, as the representative of a national revolution hostile to conservatism, but opposing social divisions as it opposed social injustice. And when European socialists gathered in 1934 to study the fascist question, Henri de Man, leading intellectual of the Belgian Labour Party and soon to become its leader, explained that, in quotations, fascism has succeeded because it emphasized the anti-capitalist sentiments to which the socialist movement no longer appealed enough. Fascism has rallied the masses by a program, by slogans, by a vocabulary that are anti-capitalistic. End quotation. Violence and history. The ideological inspiration of this attitude is to be found in the work of such men as Joseph Arthur de Gobineau, in brackets, 1816 to 1882, end brackets, and Friedrich Nietzsche, but also, and more immediately, in the writings of Georges Sorel, in quotations, It is to Sorel that I owe most, end quotation, declared Mussolini, in quotations, For me the essential was to act, end quotation. The characteristically fascist form of action, through violence, had been advocated in Sorel's best-known book, Reflections on Violence, an attempt to adjust the conventional Marxist analysis of social development to the political and economic facts of 1900. It was naive, thought Sorel, to put your trust in the gradual proletization of a society which, contrary to the predictions the Communist Manifesto had made in 1848, was becoming increasingly bourgeois and ever less inclined to desperate revolution. On the other hand, those socialists who, in view of this, hoped to achieve their aims by gradual reforms carried out within the existing system, were just as mistaken. The socialist order could only be installed by a radical revolution. To create the conditions for such a revolution, violence must be used. Violence is distasteful to sensible men. Worse, history shows it to be a wasteful and ineffective method, likely to corrupt even the worthiest cause. This is because violence has been used in a sporadic or sentimental fashion without calculating the end in view. Violence must cease to be an anarchic reflex. It should be integrated in the order of political action so as to end the dichotomy of two great historical phenomena, order and violence, too often and too wastefully opposed, and to ensure the historical realization of socialist aims, in this manner, ignoble means were dignified by a noble end and violence appeared as a morally and socially necessary form of effective action. Gobineau's essay on the inequality of human races, in brackets 1853 to 1855, end brackets, is also often cited as a basic source of fascist opposition to the sentimental humanism of an earlier day. This can be misleading for, while Gobineau argues in favor of white supremacy, Mussolini, who had been affected by his ideas, was not a racist. What Mussolini took from Gobineau was not the affirmation of white supremacy, but the idea that power must be based on the collective principle, not on universal human values like honor, freedom, or human dignity, but on biological factors of a collective or social nature, race, nation, or caste. Fascism would justify its aspiration to total control by biological considerations, and would define order by the coincidence of political and biological realities. With their insistence on living space and the survival of the fittest, fascism and national socialism appear as the political expressions of evolutionist and so-called Darwinian views. They deny transcendental values because history provides no indication of ultimate truth, and so the only valid approach must be a pragmatic one. It is, indeed, in this attitude that we discern the historical roots of fascist thought, growing from an intellectual situation in which, 
Following the death of God, history was left as the only touchstone of the absolute, a sort of theology for our time. The fate and development of nations is the bedrock of fascist reality, but this reality itself changes both in time and space. The divine spirit, which, according to Hegel, realized itself in the nation's past, could also suggest its future, but this could only be realized by the heroic few who combined the capacity to perceive such a manifest destiny with the courage to carry it out. Courage, here, is very important, for it relates once more to the deliberate activism so characteristic of fascism. Traditionalists and conservative nationalists also refer to history in order to justify setting back the clock or staying put. Blood and soil can be considered as a stable reality, as a stabilizing factor, in a situation where least change is best. But when, instead of providing a reference for traditionalists, history becomes the justification of collective, national, or racial evolution and change, when it becomes the only absolute reference of the will to power, then it is the basis of fascism. The conservative or the traditionalist does not consider history alone and of itself as his sole point of reference. Other references are as authoritative in his eyes. Great institutions and organized bodies, guilds, estates, above all, the church. But history, when it becomes the only concrete absolute capable of providing both definition and justification, is no longer referred to, in brackets, as in nationalism, end brackets, in an attempt to be true to it, but envisaged as a continuous creation, as a deliberate acceleration of human destiny entitled to overthrow or crush all obstacles before it. Once again, this explains why fascism not only uses violence, a trait which is not, after all, peculiar to fascism, but regards it as an absolute, in brackets, because necessary, in brackets, means to an absolute and necessary end. In this perspective, violence appears as the highest or, at any rate, the most obvious form of the social energy and the will to power which create history. Such an analysis may take us further than the theorist of pragmatic fascism would wish to go, but it applies to the common principles which we can discern among a great variety of fascisms all of which imply historical relativism when they argue that history awaits its maker, all of which insist that the nation exists as an absolute, expressing and affirming itself in the role it plays in history, its people incarnated in a heroic leader who embodies the world historical individual of 19th century Hegelian legend. Given his gigantic task of forging history on the hoof, the leader must be able to call on all the resources of the nation, both spiritual and material. Previous to bending his people's energies to their historical task, he must, therefore, conquer their souls. Writing about the public at one of his meetings, de Grel expressed this very well, in quotations, The crowd was magnificently subdued, entirely given over to an idea, by all its senses, by every fiber of its flesh. But what one sensed above all, and what really made these Rexist meetings worthwhile, was the quality of the soul this vibration, this total abandon of the public. Rex is the realm of total souls, withholding nothing, marching straight ahead, sure of their way. That is the true Rexist miracle. This faith, this unspoilt burning confidence. We have these souls. Who could say as much? End quotation. The Leader and the Crowd The fascist leader conquers a crowd and subdues it as he would a woman or a horse. But such a conquest implies responsibilities. When a people achieves true national self-consciousness, explains the Romanian Codrenu, in quotations, the leader is no longer a master, a dictator who does what he wants and leads where he wills. He is the expression of that invisible spirit, the symbol of this state of consciousness. He does not do what he wants, he does what he must, and he is led, in quotations, by the interests, end quotations, of the eternal nation, which the people has sensed. End quotation. Here is the basis of that cult of the leader as the emanization of his people, produced by his people as the materialization of its profound will and purpose. Such a leader is neither elected nor appointed. He affirms himself as the, in quotations, truly democratic, end quotation, chief of a group that freely accepts him. As we have seen, fascists and national socialists stress this oneness between the statesman and his people, a people that gives itself to him, trusts him, and loves him, in quotations, this is the true popular sovereignty, end quotations. 
writes Pierre Day, leader of the Rexis group in the Belgian parliament. In quotations, leaders who command with authority but who, by direct contact with their people, feel in constant communion of will and ideas with everything good in the country. When such a sympathy exists, political formulas have little importance. End quotation. The general will of the nation is now concentrated in one person in whom the people, his people, can glimpse their true historical selves, their true destiny, as in a magic mirror in which they see themselves magnified and exalted. The cult of the leader constitutes an invitation to popular auto-idolatry. Proud of their popular origins and referring to them often, Mussolini, Hitler, Eva Peron, and de Grel concentrate upon their persons not only power, but emotion and affection. The identity upon which the leader insists permits every sparrow to fly vicariously on eagle's wings and to enjoy the eagle's triumphs and his magnificence as if they were his own. Hence, perhaps one reason at least for anti-parliamentarism, which reflects not only disgust with the old order, but refusal to accept the very idea of delegation and representation, no representative assembly can replace or compete with the leader. When it comes to sheer opportunism, therefore, fascist anti-parliamentarism reflects this basic monism, an aspiration to direct democracy. Totalitarianism To be complete, the empire of fascism must extend over minds as well as bodies. From this point of view, fascism appears as the modern and technologically perfected form of the ancient polis, a society totalitarian in its way, all of whose members worshipped the city's gods and obeyed the city's rules, and the situation it creates is similar to that which Antigone faced before Creon, in brackets, where private or transcendental values clash with the ruler's will, end brackets, or Socrates before an Athenian democracy that could not tolerate mavericks for long. If the community is an organic whole, deviations are corrupting and cannot be tolerated. All must act as one, shunning dissensions as intrinsically harmful, seeking a unity which alone can save in the providential person of one man. As Drieu La Rochelle explained to the followers of Doiro, in quotations, saving France means saving the French, all the French, even those who do not want to be saved, who let themselves go, who ask only to be left alone. End quotation. Unity alone can save. The matter is important, for justified or not, fascism lives and thrives in an atmosphere of crisis. All fascism see themselves as a last recourse. All are menaced by a hostile world in a state of siege where self-sufficiency, material, and ideological is the only hope. Totalitarian autarky thus appears as a further component of the state of siege mentality, which in turn is another justification for dramatic violence as the means of history, but sometimes also as its end. In quotations, hope for me is fascist, end quotation, the Frenchman Lucien Rebatet would write in Les Decombre, in brackets, The Ruins, end brackets, published in 1942, and this hope lies only in a, in quotations, profound and brutal, end quotation, revolution. In quotations, impossible without violence and radical destructions, end quotations. Here, the romantic fascist appears too fascinated by the means to bother much with the end or to define it further. In quotations, one does not compromise with enemies like the Jews, the priests, the committee mongers, the speculators. One crushes them. One bends them to one's will. Revolutions are not baptized with holy water. They are baptized in blood. Death is the only punishment that peoples understand. Death alone condemns an enemy to oblivion. End quotation. Such exaltation over gore and death such glorification of them recalls Mussolini's panegyric of war. In quotations, War alone carries all human energies to the height of tension and leaves the imprint of nobility on the peoples that dare face it. Perhaps it is a tragic destiny that weighs on man. His fundamental virtues come to light only in bloody struggle. End quotation. It is impossible, after all this, not to speak of romanticism, the sweet rapture of vague, exalting words which inflame the imagination and stimulate the vocabulary even further. After the unexpected successes of Rex in the Belgian elections of 1936, the victors signed a sort of manifesto drawn up by one of the movement's few intellectuals, Jean Denis. In quotations, Rex is not an adventure, end quotation. The manifesto read in part, in quotations, it is something much more beautiful than an adventure. 
this great departure, this moving break with the past, this fantastic enterprise likely to attract spirits enamored of the absolute, is an answer to a call that comes from far in the past, from far in the present. End quotation. To seek a meaning in what is evidently an incantation would be a waste of time. It would be wrong, however, to imagine fascism limited to juvenile and demagogic lyricism of this sort, or, indeed, to think that juvenile and lyrical demagogy need be limited in its effects. The grandiose displays, in brackets, both Nazis and Rexists adopted the color red for their banners, and brackets, the verbiage and the wind were an essential part of great campaigns to conquer souls and hold them. Power must be attained, national unity forged, the collective will asserted by all means. Essentially democratic in its propaganda, if not in its essence. Fascism addressed itself to feelings, not to intellect. Rational appeals are accessible to few. They are also subject to criticism. Reasoning invites examination, speculation, and disagreement. Feelings can be shared, arguments seldom, and then by few. Hence, propaganda methods whose essence was determination and deliberate bias. The fascist historical relativism made academic objectivity seem as impossible to him as it does to the Marxist. Propaganda, a Rexist periodical asserted, had to be completely subjective. Ultimately, however, the individuality it expressed was that of the nation, the only ultimate to which anything could be validly related. Elitist Democracy And, while the national definition implied a kind of equality among all the members of the nation, it also suggested that, as a group, they constituted an elite. Thus, the assertion of the in-group against everybody else. All French being one against all non-French. All Germans one against, in brackets, and superior to, end brackets, all non-Germans. Provided the groundwork for both equalitarian and elitist argument. The kind of love relationship between a movement and its people, between a leader and his people, which we have recognized as the basis of a direct democracy amounting almost to a sensual union, also implied equality. Rex always insisted on the identity between the movement and its leaders and the Belgian people. The Romanian Iron Guard was essentially populist, its most devoted followers recruited from among peasants and poor university students. But, the most striking distances of this new equalitarianism are to be found in class-conscious Germany, where the Nazi organizations managed to mix the social classes to a degree never achieved before. Comparing the German army of 1940 to that of the Kaiser, Henri de Man was forcibly struck by its social unity, itself an indication of the greater social unity realized in the ranks of the nation itself. The simple ex-Nazis whom Milton Mayer interviewed after the war in a small Bavarian town, in brackets, they thought they were free, Chicago, 1955, end bracket, cherished the memory of this social revolution. In quotations, we simple working class men stood side by side with the learned men in the labor front, end quotation. A beggar would tell Mayer, in quotations, in the labor front, end quotation. Said another, in quotations, we belong to something together. We had something in common. We could know each other in those days, end quotation. Even the local school teacher, the only one to view Nazism with a critical eye, believed in the reality of democracy as part of its program and practice. In quotations, there was democracy in Nazism, and it was real. My, how shall I say it, my inferiors accepted me. End quotations. This crucial acceptance of each other by men of different social classes as equals in the nation, in the party, and in the different party organs whose hierarchy incidentally also added to the opportunities of social mixture and promotion, all this supported by incessant equalitarian propaganda and a system whose marks of social distinction differed from traditional ones, had a profound and hopeful effect. Eva Perone's jewelry and stylish dresses were part of her appeal to the Descamisados, to whom she seemed a symbol of the opportunities that Perón's justicialismo was offering to all. Well aware of this, she labored the point. In quotations, You will all have clothes like these some day. Some day you will be able to sit next to any rich woman on a basis of complete equality. What we are fighting for is to destroy the inequality between you and the wives of your bosses. End quotation. One obvious means for destroying this inequality lay in the party, with its own uniforms which, brown shirts and black shirts, green shirts and blue ones, belts and jackboots, set a man apart from the common run of humanity, proclaimed his membership in a fraternity with values and a hierarchy of its own. 
The Army, too, where the uniform begins by establishing the basic uniformity from which individuals detach themselves by abilities best suited to the Army's task, had been an excellent instrument for the abolition of social differences. But the Army, which in many countries furnished the last refuge of a haughty and tenacious class spirit, reflected and magnified the privileges and the iniquity of societies where money and influence held sway. In any case, most citizens passed through it too rapidly to be marked by its peculiar values. The war had been different. Between 1914 and 1918, the comradeship and the equality of the trenches, the opportunities that combat offered for leaders to affirm themselves and men to show their worth without any reference to birth or education, these were remembered fondly by many a combatant. With death and misery past, men recalled the better side. In Germany, Italy, Hungary, and France, the first fascist leagues were founded by men who almost yearned for the chaotic and virile hell that civilians had always ignored. Its unity, its order in the midst of chaos, and its opportunities for violent, even if useless, action. The leagues, the movements, and the parties sought to recapture or recreate all this. In brackets, see reading number 8A, end brackets. Opposite the Communist Party with its aggressive class consciousness, the fascist leagues offered movements as active, where caste was abolished in the comradeship of a new self-styled elite. Elite is a tricky term. It generally describes a body or group considered to be socially superior, and the elite spirit so prevalent in the movements we know seems at first to contradict their equalitarianism. The meaning becomes clear, however, and the contradiction less, if we remember that the equality which fascists extolled was one of origin and opportunity, very similar to that which the French Revolution had decreed, an equality from which men detached themselves to the extent that their virtues and their will could carry. Marcel Diat explained this to his followers in some detail in a speech delivered in 1941. The old democracy wanted to persuade the most backward clods that they were equal to the greatest and the best of men. It found no difficulty in doing so, but, in the process, envy became a part of a false equalitarianism. Since men were no more equal in democracy than they had ever been, envy became the essence of relations between people who, inevitably, fulfilled different functions in society. But true freedom consists of carrying out your task in the place which suits you and which you deserve, and equality has two complementary aspects. On the one hand, a quality of opportunity to begin with, for there can be no difference between men except that of their work, their talent, their true worth. On the other, in quotations, this higher, deeper, more intimate and indefinable equality which arises between leader and led, from mutual trust and from the absolute certainty that both sides carry out their duties for the common good and solely in order to serve it. End quotation. A New Chivalry To the mainstream of a grubby bourgeois world, the fascists opposed a doctrine of sacrifice, abnegation, and entire devotion to the cause similar to that which the good Bolshevik must accept, a doctrine to which they often added the mystical idea of transcendence by expiation. This last was strongest among the deeply Christian legionaries of Romania for whom, in quotations, the true and eternal victory, in brackets, was, end brackets, that born of martyrdom, end quotation. The same theme recurs on the lips of other nations, in quotations, it was by demanding devotion, exalting self-sacrifice, evoking renunciation, purity, labor gladly given, that de Grel drew the wildest applause. End quotations. Reports Pierre Day. Oswald Mosley's Greater Britain ends with these words. In quotations, Those who march with us will certainly face abuse, misunderstanding, bitter animosity, and possibly the ferocity of struggle and danger. In return, we can only offer them the deep belief that they are fighting, that a great land may live, end quotations. But it is Marcel Diat who reveals the fundamental sentiment most clearly, in quotations. People might ask whether we want to create an order. The word does not frighten me, but it has to be understood as the voluntary acceptance of a strict rule for the sake of a great task to which one has resolved to devote himself. At least, then, the revolution will have its regulars, as she will have her secular devotees. And if the future members of the one party took the oath of poverty on joining it, it would not be a bad idea. We live in times when exemplary behavior is essential, especially in those who want to reform. End quotation. Diat's order might have been one of reforming friars. A more frequent image is that of the medieval knight. We find it not only in the Nazi revival of medieval Ordensbergen, as training centers for the SS, Teutonic Knights of a Later Day, 
but also in the thought of Eugene Deloncle, who wanted his collaborationist social revolutionary movement to be like knights of old. We also find it at Nice in May 1941, when, on the day of the Feast of Jean d'Arc, Joseph Darnand, authentic hero of two wars, decided to found a militia of the Veterans Legion, in brackets, Service d'Ordre Legionnaire, end bracket, which would support Patan's national revolution, and to recruit this among young people sharing a common ideal embodied in the medieval knight. Darnand's SOL soon became the murderous and bloody militia feared auxiliary of the German occupant's Gestapo, but its oath continued to be administered to trainees on their knees who had passed the night in vigil and meditation under arms. Before a vast public gathered to hear him in Paris on his return from the Russian front, where the Germans were already in full retreat, Léon de Grel, now a colonel commanding the Walloon Legion of the SS and speaking under its auspices, put it all with his usual brio. In quotation, The true elites are formed at the front. A chivalry is created there. Young leaders are born. That is where you find the true elite of tomorrow. And there, between us, a complete fraternity grows up. For since the war, everything has changed. When we look to our own country and see some fat, stupefied bourgeois, we do not feel this man to be a member of our race. But when we see a young revolutionary from Germany or elsewhere, we feel that he is one of ours. For we are one with revolution and with youth. We are political soldiers. The badge of the SS shows Europe where political and social truth are to be found. We prepare the political cadres of the post-war world. Tomorrow, Europe will have elites such as it has never known, an army of young apostles, of young mystics, carried by a faith that nothing can check, will emerge one day from the great seminary of the front. End quotation. There was about these transports a great deal of romance, of histrionics, of enthusiasm for enthusiasm's sake. But the world conceals vast quantities of fervor, great capacities for devotion, that ask no better than to be employed. In a Western world where sometime radical and socialist parties had, in quotations, come to terms with reality, end quotations, where only communism still called on an adherent sense of sacrifice rather than on his search for security or gain, the fascists offered an alternative, however vain, in quotations, a cause, end quotation, as de Grel put it, which transcends the man asking everything from him, promising nothing. Nothing for him, of course, but great things for the nation of which he is a part, in which he finds himself the artisan of that unity and self-awareness on which national fulfillment depends. Organic Society The assertion of national unity against outside pressure or against internal faction soon brings to mind the image of an organic society in which the free individual alone in the world, making his own terms with other individuals and with society, is replaced in a complex structure of, quote, realities, end quote. His family, his trade, his region, above all his nation, all of which exist prior to him, all of whose existence is essential to his, all of whose security and prosperity are essential to his, to all of which, therefore, he and his private interests must be subordinated. This, of course, bears heavy marks of Hegelianism. In the 1920s and the early 1930s, we find a leading German advocate of the corporate state insisting that while private property exists formally, in reality, there is only collective property. What did he mean by this? Presumably that, while we may think of property as private, and even formally and legally acknowledge it as a fact, the true platonic or Hegelian reality is that property depends upon and is subject to collective existence. The collective interest, the collective will. This is the principle by which we justify taxation or the freedom of firemen to trample our lawn when putting out a fire next door, or all the other trespasses we sanction upon property called private. All so-called right-wing reactions against the liberal democracy of the 19th century have opposed the organic concept to the individualistic one. In quotations, whether fascism is a philosophy or an intuition, a vision or a faith, end quotation, wrote Mussolini, in quotations, it is always, at least virtually, an organic conception of the world, end quotation. And because it is organic, however opportunistic its pragmatism may be, the fascist tendency is towards collectivism. That is why, addressing the French Socialist Party Congress of 1933, Marcel Diat could mention, in brackets, to the horror of the President Leon Blum, end brackets, 
the possibility that fascist forms are only a transition on the way to the socialist society. It might be, suggested Dion, that one had to go through fascism, in quotations, before one could reach a truly socialist phase of production and distribution, end quotations. The great Romanian theoretician of corporatism, Mihai Manoilescu, would express a similar hope in his book, The Century of Corporatism, in brackets, 1938, end brackets, welcoming the gradual squeezing out of capital and the diminution of its influence, and expressing the conviction that Italian corporatism would move, in quotations, willy-nilly, end quotation, towards the social left.